Well, good morning and welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church of Western Springs on this second Sunday of Advent. We are so glad that you are here this morning. I don't know about where you are, but we were greeted by beautiful snowflakes gently falling as we were preparing our time of worship. And so it, it had me reflecting just on how um, wonderful it is to have those moments of peace. And today is our day where we recognize during the Advent season, the peace that comes from God. And so that will be a theme that is woven throughout our service and hopefully throughout your day uh, and throughout your week. Friends, I uh, want to invite you to uh, join us this afternoon for our Advent extravaganza. I've been very excited about this for several weeks, as you know, and uh, Lottie and I and others have been planning for it. It's a little different than we had originally hoped because of our COVID precautions, but it's going to be a wonderful time. One important thing. When we originally scheduled it, we put it as 3 p.m. And that you, we will be ready for you if you come at 3. However, the excitement is not really going to happen until a bit later, closer to four. So I would recommend, especially if you have little ones, come a little bit later, like after 3.30, so that you're not sitting in your car waiting for too long. But you definitely want to come this afternoon. There are a number of reasons. First of all, you're going to be picking up things for Christmas Eve, uh, like your candles. We've got a special item for you to take home. You're going to be able to get uh, the supplies for our gingerbread nativities that Lottie's going to mention a little bit later today. Um, you're, you're going to be able to bring canned goods if you've got them or hats, mittens, and gloves that, we can, that we're going to send out to those in need. And then we're going to have a chance to sing carols together. We'll be in our cars, but we'll be singing joyfully. And Jim and Tricia Koning have provided some music for us to sing along to. And then once we've sung the songs and the carols, we're going to light our Christmas tree. If you've been by the church in the last several uh, days, you'll have seen that uh, some elves came and we've got some beautiful decorations on the church campus. But the one thing that hasn't been lit yet is our Christmas tree. It's a beautiful 24 foot tall tree that came from the Canucks property and Diane and Donna and, uh, and Rick uh, and I went and, and cut it down and brought it to the church. There's a fun video on Facebook that you can watch. We'll also put a video in the weekly this week that shows you how it made its journey uh, here to church and then how it got uprighted. And then we'll add to the video uh, tonight once we've lit the tree. And then I hope you'll come by. And I hope you'll come by our campus regularly during the next month. I hope you'll come by and spend time with our Advent tree. Now, last week, Lottie went outside and uh, into the cold and showed you the tree. But if you come by this afternoon, you're going to see it as well. And you can add your hopes and your, your longings for peace or the, the areas where you see the joy of Christ in the world or where you experience love. You can write them on the little ornament I had one here. Here it is. You can write one on the little ornament and add it to the tree and see what others are praying for. And you can do this throughout the next um, several weeks leading up to Christmas. So I hope you'll, you'll take advantage of this. Um, the other really exciting thing that you're going to do when you come this afternoon is create a little sign that's going to be from your family. It's going to say Merry Christmas on it. And you're going to be able to create it with some permanent markers. And we're going to place them around the Christmas tree so that our family family is gathered and also sending a message to our community that we love them and that we bring Christ's light into the world. And so we'll have the supplies for that. If you've got Sharpies, you can bring them and you can work on it on your car um, or you can take it home and then come back later in the week and you can see what others have created and their greetings of love. So another way for us to be connected. And if you are not with us locally, all of these things that I've described, we can. there are ways that we can get you connected with them. If you want to send your message for the ornament, we'll write the message on an ornament and put it on the tree. If you want to send something that we can put on a sign, we'll, we'll write it on a sign for you and put it out front and send you a picture. So you are, um, we, we want you to be involved as well wherever you are. So um, I also hope that you're connecting with others. If you're watching live with us, you can connect with others in the chat room. You can offer words of greeting to them there. If you're watching later, I encourage you to send a note to someone. We'll, uh, when we pass the piece later, we'll do that as well. There's a link in the comments to our bulletin. 
And uh, if you want to follow along with the print bulletin, you can do that. There are a lot of announcements at the end of the bulletin. They're the same ones that you saw on the screen if you were here a little before 930. Um, I just want to point out a couple of those announcements for you today. In addition to the, uh, the Advent extravaganza, which is this afternoon, you can come anytime after three, but I recommend coming closer to 345. We'll see how many times I can slip that in today. Um, so you may have received a postcard in the mail. If you did not receive one of these, you can pick one up this afternoon or send an email and we'll get one in the mail to you. It's got all sorts of our activities coming up uh, throughout Advent and leading up to Christmas Eve. I encourage you to take a look at that. This coming week, we have a few of those activities happening and we're gonna hear from Kevin McDermott a little bit later about the um, mission community in conversation event and or conversation and community event coming up on uh, Wednesday evening. Um, but also on Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m., there's going to be a grief share session. It's a um, hour, hour and a half session over Zoom talking about surviving the holidays and some tips and some um, approaches to, to help you with that. There's more information in the bulletin on the website as well. And I encourage you to take a look at that. The other thing is that this past week, our alternative giving fair has been online. I wonder if you've had a chance to check it out. There are ways to support Nueva Paz, our congregation partner in Cuba, Margaret's Village, the uh, Heifer Project International, and Pine Avenue Food Pantry. And for each of these, you can make a gift and then give that to someone in honor of them. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to keep it open. Technically, it ends today, but we're going to keep it open for a few more days. I encourage you to go to the, our website and check it out and see if there are some things that you could make contributions for that would be more meaningful gifts than perhaps uh, the uh, items we often give, especially to the people who have everything. You can give them chickens and bees uh, from Heifer uh, instead of, I don't know, a fruitcake or something like that. Next Sunday during worship, we're going to be doing something super special, which is recognizing our confirmation class. They have had a strange confirmation year. Uh, it's been a little longer than normal um, because of the pandemic, but also we had to go virtual with a lot of things, including their service. So that's going to be a great time. There are seven confirmands and Rogers Malone, our, our primary teacher, will be uh, with us in worship. And um, it's going to be a very exciting, uh, a very exciting time together. All right. I could go on and on, but I know there's people out there flailing their arms saying, no, Eric, don't go on and on. We know that things are coming. Um, so I'm sure I left something out that I want to share about, but you know what? I'll probably add it later if I did. All right. Today in worship, I'm so excited because we have a we have several musicians joining us, uh, and we also have um, some a, a duo of liturgists. We have a candle lighting from some folks who um, are in our midday prayer group. You're going to hear about that in a moment. And with all of this coming, I hope you'll take a deep breath and prepare your hearts and your minds for worship. As we gather, we recognize that that is what we're doing. We are worshiping God when we gather in this place. And so um, take a few slow, deep breaths, recognize that this is our time of worship. And with that, Maddie and Susie, I think we're ready. Good morning. I hope that everyone is having a great weekend so far. We are wearing purple today because the peace candle for Advent is purple. Please join us in the call of worship. Today, we gather from north, south, east, and west to sit at God's table alongside friends and strangers. We bring with us the courage of Mary. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We bring with us the faith of the shepherds. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We bring with us the worshipful hearts of the Magi. O come, O come, Emmanuel. For as we wait, and prepare for the birth of Christ, we know that Christ is with us even now. Come, let us worship God.
Advent candles this morning will be lit by participants in the midday prayer group. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light again the candle of hope. We have just a glimmer of light. Today, we add the candle of peace to the candle of hope. In a world that is often filled with darkness, we follow a God who seeks to bring a new peace, a holy peace. We follow a God who brings comfort we continue to be people of hope today. And we place our trust in the one who can bring peace and bring light into the darkness. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Brian Stevenson, he's the author of the book Just Mercy, talks about truth as healing. He says that in order to heal ourselves and our families, our communities, and our world, the first step is to tell the truth about who we are and what our history is. This truth telling brings us closer to God and closer to one another. So trusting in God's mercy, let us now confess our sins before God first in silence, and then joining our voices together. Continuing in prayer, God of peace, you desire a world where wolf can lie down with lamb and a little child will lead them. We lift our broken world to you, taking careful note of all the places that are not peaceful. We repent of the ways we contribute to this absence of peace. Forgive us for our greed, our hurriedness, and the ways we misuse the earth. Make us agents of your peace, here and everywhere, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. 
Christ is the Prince of Peace, and he has come to earth to reconcile all people. You are included in this peace. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Having been reconciled to God, we also reconcile ourselves to one another. We seek to bring peace to one another as we seek to bring peace into the world. Before we pass the peace, I do have one other very important thing to share, which is that Scott and Cindy Carstens let us know earlier this week that they have become grandparents again because William Patrick was born to Emily and Patrick this past week on December 2nd. It's such an exciting thing to celebrate the coming into the world. And so um, as baby Theo or young Theo uh, welcomes baby Will into, uh, into his home, we too prepare to welcome the Christ into our lives. And so we practice that by practicing the act of passing peace to one another so that when we go out into the world, we will bring peace into the world. And so friends, I encourage you to pass the peace of Christ to those in the chat room, those you are worshiping with at home. And if you're watching later, perhaps pause the worship service and maybe give someone a phone call or a greeting of peace in some other way. And so friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Today in Sunday School, we are learning about Mary. At this point in the Advent story, Mary is still visiting her cousin, Elizabeth. And while she's at Elizabeth's house, she sings a song of peace that today we call the Magnificat. It's a song about the peace that Christ brings to earth, literally the peace on earth. If you would like a nativity for your own home, perhaps an edible nativity, swing by the Advent extravaganza this afternoon, and one of these will be ready for you. Um, this is an all ages event, so everyone is welcome. Um, on Tuesday, we'll meet on Zoom to assemble them together. I would also like to extend a word of gratitude to Isabella Davia and the Merrifield family for coloring our bulletin artwork today. They did a wonderful job. This is our second week of Advent, the week of peace. So thank you, Isabella and the Merrifield family. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses one through 11. Listen for the word of God. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the, month of the, Lord, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I say, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. 
Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Be the Lord, see, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. And gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susie and Maddie. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks this day for your word of scripture that gives us a glimpse of who you are. We give you thanks and we ask your blessing on our time of continued worship this day. Amen. Every few months, I try to return to some variation of a question that's at the root of our human identity and our experience. How do you imagine God? If you were to draw a picture of God, what would it look like? What would God be doing? If I asked you to describe God, what words would come to mind, both descripting, describing God's appearance and perhaps God's nature? I wonder if your answer might have developed over time. Did you have an image of God from Sunday school or from books or from your parents or grandparents or maybe even from the movies? Maybe you think of deep voices, sort of ethereal and just a little off camera. Or maybe a sophisticated accent, like a vaguely British accent. Maybe the god of your memories or your imagination has a long beard. And speaking of beards, how did the god of your memories, your idea of god, treat humans, treat you? I say speaking of beards because the image of God often sounds like another chap with a long white beard, one who's making a list and checking it twice, who knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. I don't know what images of God you grew up with, and I don't know what your image of God is today. But humanity has been imagining the divine for some time. Humans have created images of God in art, in their minds, and even in words and poetry. We have used whatever means we have to try and articulate who God is or God might be and what God is up to. I've talked with some of you uh, over the past few years about who God is to you, what God looks like to you, how you imagine God, and the images I've heard described have been so wide-ranging. One of you said to me once, I'm not sure whether I believe in God, but if I believe in her, she's a big loving grandmother. Another person described God as being impossible to describe. And that was it. They left it at that. Another person described God in a very traditional, even popular culture way by describing the long bearded old man on a cloud. Interestingly, that was the youngest person. And the oldest person was the one who said to me that God was indescribable and moved on sort of like leave it alone. The one who saw God as a big loving grandmother was right in the middle. You know, we can't help but have our understanding of God shaped by a whole variety of inputs. Like I said, movies, television, artwork, all of these have given us a picture, a sound, and a sense of God. And if we look at the collection, the variety of these images of God that appear in these outlets and in the minds of one another, perhaps that alone is enough to make us see just how challenging it is to understand God and to envision God. And I also think we begin to see, though, that for many people, our understanding of God is more shaped by popular culture than it is by scripture or even by the church. In fact, the church is more silent sometimes about who God is than we should be. Surprisingly, while we have creeds and confessions and hymns that say so much about God, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the God we follow. 
one of the reasons I think people often leave the church, especially younger people, is that there's been very little attempt to look at the mystery of who God is. Instead, we assume belief and we assume common understanding of God. And when those questions are either ignored or dismissed, or when challenges to the popular culture images or even the Sunday school caricatures of God are left unanswered, when the challenges are left unanswered, people drift away. They, they move on like, like they move on from believing in, well, other fanciful things. And this isn't really new. When looking throughout history, and especially modern history, this is a large part of why fear has been used in the church so much. Fear used as a tool to drive people into church or to drive people away from disbelief. Fear of God. Remember, he knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Don't question God or wrestle with understanding of God because you don't want God to smote you. And you don't want the wrath of an angry, often male, God. So culturally, even in the recent past, and in many circles still today, to either deny God or express ambivalence about God's identity, it's seen as, as cringeworthy, socially unacceptable. And yet, even within most churches, there's not much attempt to try and understand this God we profess to follow perhaps one we follow out of allegiance or fear or inheritance or cultural attachment, or perhaps even one we follow because God is part and parcel with the things of the church that we do know and love and value, the fellowship, the companionship, the friendship. And the reality is that all of these things, these acts of love, they are embodiments of God. They are indications of God's goodness. They are ways we understand God more and they are wonderful, wonderful expressions of God's love in the way the church interacts with one another, for sure. But we still have this lingering question, who is God? What does God look like? What are God's characteristics? Why does God matter? As we take this ancient and sacred Advent journey toward the birth of Christ, why does any of that matter? Why does it matter that God would become human? It only matters if God matters. And God only matters when we examine our own relationship with God and our understanding of God. Theologians have done this for centuries. In fact, that's really all that theology is about. It is the study of God. And I've shared this before, but theologians have been fighting about God for a very long time fighting not always for the sake of disagreement, but really they've been fighting because they're in deep discourse in trying to explain God using words. And for most of us, these nuanced arguments are pretty meaningless because they become so esoteric. Their writings though, whether we know it or not, they've shaped our understanding of God, even those popular culture images of God I described before. And St. Augustine's work, from the fourth century, for instance, has shaped much of what the church, our church even, still teaches about God. And these theologians are important, for sure. But there's no substitute for our own exploration of God and our beliefs in God. But there is a unifying connection between the historical and modern theologians and our own understanding of God. Actually, there are at least two significant connections. One is experiential, and we've talked about that before. We know of God in the warmth of caring actions. We know of God in our experiences of love that we have from others when we're in trouble or in a challenging time. We know of God when the church surrounds us in our difficult times or when we experience a beautiful sunrise or sunset or the wonder of creation. Experiences of God's goodness, experiences we can taste and see and touch and smell, they truly shape our understanding of God. Creation points to the creator. The second connection that you and I have to theologians is that our understanding of God is informed by scripture. God's nature, God's attributes, God's character, these are all expressed in scripture 
in the experiences and observations of the writers, but also in the way that God, over and through time, has chosen to be revealed to humanity. One of the activities we often do in our Wednesday Bible study is consider the question of how God is portrayed in a particular scripture. We'll ask the question, what do you see about God here? Sometimes the answer is unsettling or uncomfortable, and we sit with that discomfort. We sit for a moment and try to ask ourselves why there is discomfort and what it means for us and for our faith. But then other times, as we approach Scripture, we gain a dimension of God that helps shape our understanding of the one we follow. We look for the attributes. We follow the signs that point to who God is. In Christ, we most often see these divine attributes right in front of us. We see Christ's abundant love, particularly for those who are marginalized and without power. We see Christ's transformation of the poor and the hungry and the sick and the imprisoned. We see Christ's attributes of healing and of compassion and of deliverance. We see these divine attributes in Christ that show us something of God's nature. The more we look at scripture, we see that the mystery of God is that we can't pigeonhole God into our simplified definitions. Our quest as Christians is to be ones who learn about and explore these attributes, constantly shaping and reshaping our understanding of God and allowing God to reshape how God is being revealed in our lives. Each Advent, this is what we do. Our lives can be lives of Advent, lives of expectation, lives of being open to God's revelation, to God's revealing of who God is, to God's willingness to come into our lives and be present with us, present with you. And the more we approach God at Advent, the more we allow ourselves to seek God through Scripture and through our experiences, the more of God's nature is revealed to us. This morning, our text from Isaiah that Maddie and Susie read for us is a revelation of God. This text was written to a people who were lost and confused. They've been forced to worship other gods, and they've been the victims of great oppression. The text comes on the heels of, of great destruction and the exile of the people from their homeland. The people are in the midst of upheaval. Earlier this week, Lottie asked me a question. She asked how I felt about the use of the word peacelessness in our prayer of confession. We talked about the word, this possibly made up word a little bit, and decided at my urging on different phrasing. I kicked myself later though, because the more I sat with our text for this Sunday, I realized that we can best understand peace if we can understand the state of peacelessness. And peacelessness is exactly what the people are experiencing in this morning's text. And I wonder if you experience peacelessness. I wonder if the absence of peace in your life is sometimes easier to understand than the peace the absence of peace, the peacelessness, is the state into which God makes God's presence known. In Isaiah, it is in this peacelessness, the unsettledness, the wilderness of exile, but also the wilderness of grief and the wilderness of sorrow and detachment and loneliness, in the wilderness of forgotten dreams, and in the wilderness of separation from loved ones, and the anxiety of a world where racism and a pandemic and political strife and discord and where the cold of winter comes. This is the peacelessness where God makes God's presence known and where God says comfort where God brings comfort. 
and where God issues a directive, not to us, but to the heavenly council God has gathered, the angels and messengers and others to whom God says, bring my comfort. Bring my comfort to my people. Bring peace into the peacelessness. Comfort my people. This is who God is. God is the God who brings comfort. God is the God who comes to bring something other than peacelessness into our lives. Something other than the separation we feel from a God we cannot see and cannot define defined so easily, and we cannot comprehend. God who brings comfort. God who brings peace like a shepherd, Isaiah writes. God who will gather us into God's arms and carry us. This is God. This is the God we follow, the God we worship, the God for whom we are created to seek, the God in whom we find our peace and the God who is with us, Emmanuel, the God who comes to us. In the midst of all the disorder of their lives, as the people are wandering and filled with peacelessness, they hear those words of comfort. But perhaps the most comforting words they might hear, the, the most comforting words we might hear, the most comforting knowledge is the declaration that even in the midst of all struggle, here, here in your peacelessness, here, right here, here is your God. Here is your God, here with you, around you, in your wilderness, in your story. Here is your God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As we transition to our time of celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, I want to invite you to gather your elements for communion. I realize I didn't alert you to that at the beginning of the service, so if you need a moment to go retrieve some bread or some um, and some fruit of the vine, I encourage you to do so. We celebrate communion remotely, we are saying, from a distance, but in reality, Whenever we celebrate communion, we are being united with others throughout the world, other Christians throughout time and place who are celebrating this act of, uh, act of communion to which Christ invites us. Christ invites all to gather in this place. Christ invites all to gather at Christ's table, and it is through the Holy Spirit that we are united wherever we might be. And so, friends, it is written in Scripture that they will come from north and south and from east and west to gather at table for this feast, the Feast of the People of God. Please join Lottie and I in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us in your image and set us in this world to love and serve you. When we were captives in slavery, you decided, delivered us to freedom and made us covenant to be and made covenant to be our sovereign god when we were stubborn and stiff-necked you spoke to us through prophets who looked for that day when justice shall triumph and peace shall reign over all the earth you are holy o god of majesty and blessed is jesus christ your son you sent him into this world to bring freedom to the captives of sin and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering, dying an unjust death. We rejoice that in his dying and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where all will sit at table with Christ, our host. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Strengthen us, O God, in the power of your spirit to bring good news to the poor and loose the chains that bind. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, 
he took the cup. And after giving blessing, he poured it and said to his friends, This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink of it. And so when you eat this bread, whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me until I come again. And so friends, we celebrate this day, this sacrifice of our Lord, this coming into the state of peacelessness into which we live to be the Prince of Peace, to bring the light. And friends, we celebrate this gift when we break the bread and we drink the cup with one another. And so I invite you to, um, with those with whom you are gathered or recognizing that you are being gathered and knit together by the Holy Spirit, I invite you to share the body of Christ broken for you and the cup of Christ poured out for you. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this supper that you prepare for us, this table to which you invite us, this table around which you unite us. We give you thanks this day. We ask your blessing on us as we go out into the world and take with us, take with us a bit of you, a bit of your revelation, a bit of how you see us and treat us and how you envision us to be in your world. Gracious God, we, thank, we give you thanks this day for new life, for William Patrick and for his family. We pray for all those who are struggling in this world, those who suffer, those who are recovering, those for whom there will be no recovery. We know, God, that you stir in their midst and in their lives. God, we give you thanks for this congregation, a place where we can experience your love and a place where we can learn about you and draw nearer to you and bring you to others who need your revelation so deeply. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue our time of worship by hearing from Kevin McDermott, one of the members of our mission committee, who's going to share with us about a special opportunity coming up this Wednesday night. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see you virtually as it is. Uh, when you normally see me uh, talking to you, it's because I'm asking you for money. So for a change, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to invite you to join us to see how we in the mission committee do spend the money that you give us. We are instituting a new program called Community Conversations. And our first, uh, first event will be this Wednesday, December 9th, 7 p.m., 7 till 8.15 via Zoom, of course. And the topic will be Let's talk about homelessness. Now, you may say, well, that sounds like a downer. Why do I want to hear about that? Well, it's very important, particularly now, as you know, with the pandemic, with the potential economic recession that may accompany the newest surge, homelessness is an increasing problem. And so we are going to feature representatives from three organizations that we at PCWS support financially. So we'll hear from uh, the Knight Ministry, one, the Boulevard, and Chicago Hopes for Kids. So we would encourage you to join us. Uh, you can find all the details you need about this event on our website. If you go to pcws.org and look under the mission section, you'll see a new entry there that says Community Conversations. Click on that link, you'll get a page of description, including a brief description of our panelists. I'll be the moderator, yes, yours truly. And we really encourage you to share that with your friends as well. It's a way to introduce other members of our larger community to the work that we do here at PCWS. So uh, again, that will be this Wednesday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Community Conversations, please join us. Check the website for the link, and we hope to see you all then. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Kevin. We're really looking forward to this. I hope to see you there for this wonderful event. Um, the link will also be in, a, in an email that's going to go out this afternoon um, with some other links for this week. So we're trying to always keep the links available to you. But if you ever are wondering, you can always send an email um, or look on the website because we're keeping all the links for important things on our website at presbws.org. Um, I also want to encourage you to continue your financial support. It is part of our offering. It is uh, part of our worship, rather. It's what we do um, when we bring our gifts before God. And then we are able as a church to further the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. And so I encourage you to do that and remind you that as you come this afternoon, you can bring items from your pantry, non-perishable goods to donate to the Second Baptist Church of LaGrange Food Bank. You can do that anytime during the week, um, but you could bring that this afternoon as well as hats, mittens, and gloves. Those are part of our offering as well. And so friends, we are uh, going to 
close our time of worship by singing our, our last hymn. And I, I'm noting the time and recognizing that Sunday school for our kids usually starts right at 1030. We'll start just a, a hair late. Um, our teachers may be in the room ready, but we'll um, we'll start when the uh, after the postlude. So um, hang tight. With that, we'll sing our final hymn. Friends, our time of worship has come to a close, but our time together today has not. As you know, our kids are going to be in Sunday school in a few moments, and then later this afternoon, we're encouraging you to come on down to, uh, to the church. A note, you'll enter on 53rd, so on the side with the small parking lot, you'll enter there and uh, you'll be directed from there. And so I encourage you to come anytime after three, but I would recommend closer to 345. Today was a special day of worship as we had um, uh, we were led in music by Stephanie and Josie and Katie and Kay, but also you didn't see that we were led by Julie Spring, who was playing the harp, and by Diane Wood, who was playing the oboe and the English horn. And so thank you to all of our musicians and inter instrumentalists uh, and to all those who participated in, le in leading worship today. Friends, oh! and our bread that was made by uh, Betty Banovic today. It was a beautiful challah bread. So thank you to all who helped uh, lead worship and to guide our time together. And friends, uh, as I said, our time of worship has come to a close. And so we go out into the world. We go out into a world that all too often knows peacelessness, a world that is in need of God's peace, that is in need of a God who says, comfort my people. A God who says, here I am with you, wherever you are. That's peace. 
that comes from God. That is the God whom we worship. And so, friends, I invite you to go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one who is with you here wherever you are. Amen.